Okay, well, I guess we'll get going here. Um, first of all, I uh, apologize. We're, we're uh, not being recorded, or well, we are being recorded on Dan's phone. Um, seems like uh, the IT department dropped the ball and didn't show up today. So, um, we need to have good minutes and uh, audio, audio, audio recording of that, excuse me. Um, so, we'll start out with our roll call. Um, Michelle, can you? Julia Lopez? Here. Russ Hansen? Here. Ellen Holman? Here. Kathy Child? Here. James Steen? Here. Corey DeLorean? Athena Grasek? Here. Thomas Scrabinoff? Here. Mark Boxlin? Dave Sutterquist? Here. And Joel Ryder? Here. Yes. Next item on the agenda is the approval of our March 20th, 2019 minutes. Has everybody had a chance to review those? Do you, do you mind a question on number four? I mentioned this to Michelle. It says I wasn't there, but the motion to approve the amendment to the charter. Was there a, an amendment that was approved? I don't know. tell from Looked like there was a request for copies of. Yes, and that that was approved back in uh, 2016, 2016, and it was just an update. Okay. So it wasn't the motion approved last meeting. <coughs> no. Okay. That 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 motion was approved uh, okay. in, in a previous meeting. Other than that, there are, I have a couple of additions that are corrections. Um, on the motion carried on uh, item three, and under new business, the last item, they're on the absent. Um, Ken Tangen was uh, no longer a member, and Darwin Lander was no longer a member, they're listed as absent. Uh, and Kathy, was absent, but Kathy Chan was absent, but, but you weren't on here. I wasn't notified. Mr. Lincoln was also not there. So on all of those, it should be absent five, and then with Kenneth and Darwin removed, and Kathy added to that. I wanted that. You were, but you didn't know about the meeting. Yeah. I didn't know. Not at the time, no. I didn't yeah. know about the meeting. So those are the corrections I have, and uh, we'll address that too. Um, any other corrections? I move that we accept the minutes as amended. I have a motion by Athena. To second. Second by Mark. Any more discussion? All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Uh, next item reports to the chair, officers, commissions, and committees. Um, I'll start out with that a little bit. Um, yeah, we need to do a better job, and I think we have on this meeting to get everybody informed of our meeting dates. And uh, we, you know, it's an important commission. We've got a couple of important items on the agendas that um, we'd like to have all of our 11 members here for, the, for discussion. Um, so, but I think this time, has anybody not got any issues this, with this time with notifications? Okay. And if not, um, also, um, Dan pointed out too, we were all, um, I think at one time, everybody was uh, issued a, a charter book with things, and uh, Dan has a newer updated version with all the updates in there. Um, yeah, everybody will make a binder for everybody that's got the updated charter, bylaws, all of the, you know, the roster membership, a bunch of supporting material. So, and, um, and, and just a little cleanup on that, too. I imagine to do that now. Um, that and uh, there was a mandatory bylaws back in 2014. I'll read that off of the... Uh, <clears throat> what I have here. If I can find it. Uh, 
Last item on the July 17, 2014 minutes. Um, motion to change the bylaws to the state that the chair or his or her designee be the only spokesperson to the media. Uh, <coughs> by Gilmar, seconded by Hegeman. Motion approved with Danielson voted no. That was never added for our bylaws. And just as a little housekeeping thing, that should be added. I don't think there's any information or anything we need to do that other than make that little housekeeping correction. So mm -hmm. uh, before we get a reminder, hopefully that's a bad that patch. Okay. Uh, any other reports from the chair, officers, or any other commissioners have anything to report? If not, um, we always invite a little public comment. Anybody in the audience that would like to speak on, on anything that's uh, not on the agenda? If you want to speak to something on the agenda. Um, I know we have requests to speak for out front, but um, I guess at, at this meeting, we've never really done that too much. So um, if you will, if there's any item you want to speak to that's on the agenda, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll call you forward to speak. So I'll ask one more time, anything, anybody in the attendance that would like to speak on something that's not on the agenda? Seeing none, um, we're going to unfinished business. Chamber membership amendment. Um, I think I'll, for now we'll switch that over to Dan, if he's got anything to say. Sure, that. absolutely. So there was a decision today. before, thanks you, uh, Chair Steve. Uh, there was a decision, uh, a request before, well, I'll request in a presentation at the last meeting about whether the Charter Commission wants to let the City Council make a decision about chamber membership. And um, City Attorney John Shockley put, um, draft was, was asked to draft a, an amendment to the Charter, and that is in your packet uh, before you today to, to review um, and recommend um, to proceed. And uh, does everybody have a chance to look at that? Chair Steen, um, yeah. it wasn't during the last meeting, um, maybe someone, apparently we don't understand the ability to decide yeah. to become chamber, a, a, a chamber member. Is that yeah, I may turn on the state statute. Yeah, so there, uh, it's a great question, uh, Commissioner. There is a state, um, a number of attorney general opinions from the Minnesota Attorney General who in, who's indicated that absent a specific statutory provision within uh, the Minnesota statutes, uh, cities uh, can't become members of local chambers of commerce. Uh, there is a provision within state statute that says that you can expend up to $50,000 for economic development. However, the AG opined that is for like a project, an economic development project, rather than actual memberships within an organization. Uh, the Minnesota uh, Auditor's Office has also taken the position that uh, public expenditures for membership fees are are not a public purpose unless they're authorized by statute, what the AG says they're not, or if you have a provision within your home rule charter that would authorize the city to be a member of a local chamber. When I drafted the uh, charter amendment, I tried to keep it very uh, general, so it'd be local chambers of commerce. Uh, and this would still need to go to the council for approval. Uh, keep in mind, this just authorizes the council to become uh, members. It doesn't, they'd have to take a second vote to actually approve becoming a member. This is just giving them the authority in uh, the city charter so that the state auditor's office doesn't uh, ding the city on becoming a, a member of a chamber of commerce without the public, without having specific authorization and statute. Uh, 
and uh, the Moorhead Economic Development Authority can still be a member because that's a separate political subdivision, but the city needs needs to have some sort of either statutory authorization, which currently there's nothing in statute that will authorize them, uh, or uh, pursuant to the city charter. And so what this does is just clean that. It's a housekeeping matter to allow the city to become a member and pay the membership fees and appoint somebody to be a member. Thank you. Any other questions or comments on that? Um, yeah, so the Chamber of Commerce is a private um, organization, um, a lobbying organization um, that has as some of its primary ob objectives to uh, pass legislation that is opposed to workers' rights, pass legislation opposed to Station, pass legislation opposed to clean air and climate change legislation. Um, they were opposed to the Affordable Care Act. Um, they're a private lobbying group. And I do understand how it would be attractive to be a member because locally you would have the advantage of a group that's putting on events, that's marketing for the city's benefit. That I mean, I understand some components of that, but I think the Attorney General decision to not allow cities to become members of any private organization, Chamber of Commerce being only one of many, which it cannot, it cannot become members of, um, makes good sense because this is public money, this is public dollars that will be expended, and I, um, I think it's really questionable that the city would be amending its charter to allow for membership in one particular organization that is a private membership, um, dues paying organization, as opposed to, I mean, if we're gonna join memberships, we might as well join memberships. But um, I think it's, um, I think it's a, a big change to adjust the charter to allow for purchasing a membership in one private organization. I kind of want to narrow this down to, I mean, we don't, um, this commission here will not decide if they should join or not. I mean, we, we, we decide whether they have the ability to join. They have to, um, that's a decision that the council themselves has to make, whether they think it's prudent to join an organization, that organization or any other organization like that. So, I mean, I'd like to focus more on the fact that do we as a commission um, think the council should be allowed to join or not? I, and, and they are the elected officials, in, in my opinion, and that's, I guess, that they are the ones that should make that call. But um, that's my opinion. It's, uh, and I, I'd like to keep it to that. I don't want to. Um, uh, this isn't a chamber thing to me. It's the ability for the uh, council to join or not. And um, just to refresh my memory, you, you can correct me, John, if I'm wrong. Um, it, if, we, if we pass this, it goes to the council. To amend the charter, the council has to agree 100%, uh, including the mayor. So even if we send it to the council, there's no guarantee that there will be a charter amendment to it. I mean, it, I don't know how they're going to vote. Um, but um, the thing is, on my side of it, I'm saying we're throwing it to them to make that decision. And uh, they are the elected officials. Whether, and I, like I said, I want to try to keep the chamber thing out of it. It's just uh, their decision to make that call or not. So. Interested in hearing more opinions? I think what we're doing here is making a precedent for whatever down the road. Mm -hmm. And I don't really feel that the city should be a paying member of the Chamber of Commerce. I have a okay. real, real problem with that. Okay. Mark? I have a question for the city attorney. Uh, the way you phrase this, um, more a business association, is that considered the Chamber of Commerce? Is that something the council can join without this? Just out of curiosity. 
Well, I drafted it to cover those contingencies because I drafted it to be local chambers of commerce. Uh, so not knowing, you know, over time policies of organizations change, names change. So I tried to make it as broad as possible so that if there's a future successor to the current chamber that has you know, a different view, the city is still authorized uh, to become a member and pay membership dues to it. And so I'd have to look specifically at the Moorhead Business Association and what, uh, what type of funds that we're using for it whenever you ask for a, a require, uh, a question about a public expenditure uh, there's a couple parts of the analysis first you have to find a legal basis for it then second if it's authorized by your budget so uh, I'd, I'd have to take that back to see if the business the Moorhead Business Association has any types of issues with its membership but this this is drafted to be broad enough so it would cover future whatever that local chamber of commerce would look like that's why I didn't specifically name the, the organization I just said a local chamber of commerce um, does Morgan have an economic development authority? Yes. Yes. Is there any reason why that body is not able to put on events and advertise on the city's behalf? I think I'll defer to the city manager. That's more of a policy question. Yeah, I think the um, the chamber is here and they can speak to that as well. Um, the Economic Development Authority can be a member of the chamber. That's not, um, it can. yeah, it can. That's what I said. Yep. And um, but it doesn't represent the city. They wouldn't. We, the city would then not be a member. The the it starts at the, even the title. The the Fargo Moorhead West Fargo Chamber. It wouldn't be Moorhead because the city of Moorhead isn't participating. If if this charter amendment doesn't pass and if the council decides not to, so there are many steps here. Three steps actually along the. Way, but it's not the same. It wouldn't represent the city. It would be for economic development and only for economic development. That is not the city joining the chamber. What is the purpose of the city joining the chamber other than what you just stated? So there's men uh, memos that we've circulated. There should be information in your packet. Um, Jim Parsons is here from the chamber if you want to go over all that again. Craig Whitney, or st staff, was here last time we can go from top to bottom down it all again but we have had that discussion several times Dave? just a question about Fargo and West Fargo just curious what they have chamber membership and then how about other cities in Minnesota Rochester St. Paul so um, Fargo and West Fargo are members of the chamber, as are um, several other surrounding communities, Dilworth, et cetera. Um, Dilworth, they're not charter, though. They're a statutory city, aren't they? I, I don't, I don't know. know how that worked now. I think they're still a member as of right now. I'm not exactly what's, sure what's going on with that. Um, um, as far as other large cities in Minnesota, if they are charter city, many of them have been through this process and have allowed the council to decide in our members, but I don't have a list. Any other questions, comments? Anybody in attendance would like to speak on the subject? Julian, please. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I remember, the, the way I remember our conversation last meeting was I had asked a couple questions uh, to the, the representatives from the chamber, and uh, in, in a scenario, and I think uh, Mayor Voxlin had brought this up too, um, that there is potential for someone who is involved with both the EDA or the uh, MPS or the city council um, or city staff um, that in, in that sort of Venn diagram situation that there is potential for a double mem membership cost for one person. Um, and I don't remember getting a, a solid answer on that. Um, and one thing that uh, stood out to me especially was that there seemed to be a um, uh, arbitrary uh, dues system for different types of organizations. And um, if anyone wants to, to clarify that, um, I, I would appreciate that. But uh, I, I seem to remember the conversation being, well, if it's a if it's a hotel, then it's this many dollars per employee, or if it's a, you know, if it's a 
you know, any, any other kind of business, it's this amount. Um, and with that kind of uncertainty, with regard to the documents uh, that we received from our staff, and thanks again for sending those because I found those to be very helpful. Um, how I interpreted the statute uh, interpretation was that we need to have an itemized, um, more or less bill of goods provided or services provided, and we haven't had that. We didn't have that the last meeting. We don't have it this meeting. Um, so I would, for me, uh, before I would feel comfortable even moving forward on this, I would like to see that specifically. Um, and I remember uh, researching too before our last meeting that uh, on the chamber's website there's no mention of how much dues are or a specific count of what would be provided with membership. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, good question, Julian, about the dual membership. Um, so MPS is a par department of the city legally, so they are not going to be allowed to continue their membership. So there won't be a double payment there. The city would pay for the department for the city of Moorhead if the city council decides to be a member of that. There are no staff that are listed as members. It's a group, it's a number based on the quantity or size of your organization. We did start heading in that direction and I believe Chair Steen corrected us last time, did a course correction and said, that isn't the issue here, that's for the council to consider and decide. Mm -hmm. That's why we stopped that part of the conversation last time, if I recall correctly. Mm -hmm. As far as a list of the pros and cons, um, that's been circulated, it was attached to the last agenda also. We certainly could have send it again, it's the same information, but we could have send it, we could um, send it again. I don't know why it wasn't attached to this agenda, but it was attached to the last and it was circulated. The the whole kind of, pro, the, just from a staff perspective, so it was real general, because the council hasn't been able to take this issue up because, until it gets to the council. I'm sure they'll have more pros and cons if it gets to the council for them to talk about. Uh, Joel first, then yeah. Julian. Well, I was going to go back to Jim's comments where I think at this point we're looking at details and things that the council will look at when they vote. We as this commission need to look at it if it's, if it's right for this commission, our charter, if it's legal. The, the details on the payments and I mean that's for the council to decide whether it's right or wrong. We, we have to decide if it's legal and I think John and Christina have showed us that there's other cities doing it, so I think we have to narrow our focus and not look at the, you know, maybe we're looking at a broader, not all the details. Yep. And Julian? Um, so, uh, yeah, a couple things. I, I seem to remember there being confusion uh, that was brought up. I don't remember who brought it up, but it was a member of this commission um, last meeting as to what membership for the city meant, uh, whether that's the voters, the council, the city staff, whomever. Uh, and I still don't feel like it, it was really clarified um, with regard to the potential for overlapping membership. Um, and that was why I brought that up. Uh, also, um, with regard to previous statements today about our role in this, I, uh, something that I brought up at, at the last meeting was that I don't think we should um, look to uh, shirk our responsibility as a uh, check and balance of our city government, um, especially when, and again, this is my concern, is that you know we're, we're opening the door to um, giving, you know, at the end of the day, tax dollars to an organization um, who, in my opinion, hasn't provided uh, a clear account of what will be provided by those funds, by that membership. And I, I do uh, agree that, you know, we have an important role to play um, on, on uh, you know, as a whole, but I, I you know, opening the door to um, membership you know, kind of makes me want to start an organization myself, you know, and say, well, maybe we should be a member. Um, you know, and so where, where do we draw the line with regard to organizations for which we pay memberships? That's, that's a big concern. But to get back to that point, I mean, we, get, we need to look at the, the primary focus here. And that's, I mean, 
again, and, and as Joe stated, do we want to send this to the council for them to make up the decision whether this amendment should be passed? Um, they can, as Joel stated, look into the details of it, whether it's a good or bad. It's, I, I'm looking at it as a fact. It's just, do we make our elected, do we allow our elected officials to make the call whether to join this organization or not? Um, to me, we're kind of pulling that away from them to make that call. Um, I, I, I think it is their call. That's my opinion. Um, but I think we should, uh, I, I, in my opinion, uh, I think it's their call, and we got to look at it as a, the primary directive is we change the charter to allow them to make that decision to join the chamber, not uh, whether we think we should join the chamber or not. So, um, Joel? I was just going to add to that, that it's hard not to put your personal feelings and thoughts into whether it's a good idea or not. But this commission is not that. It's if it's something that can be passed and other cities have passed, then to Jim's point, we have to give the council the ability to either accept it or deny it. That's not up to us to decide. If it's something that's legal and can be done and it should be in our charter, then that's our job. I would counter that it might be legal and there might be other cities that have joined it. That purpose of this commission is to safeguard the operating structure for our city. And we're talking about a sizable expenditure of public funds for a private membership to a private organization. And I just think that we need to very carefully consider whether that is something that the city council should even be able to decide about. Why should the city charter allow membership in one private organization and not others? I, I mean, Tom. I don't think it's Charter Commission's decision or to weigh economic impacts of organization or what the city council does. I, I think it's just our job to give them the responsibility to make that decision for themselves. I, I don't think we, I don't think that's within the Charter to argue economics. The only, the only exception I can think of is a fire plug issue that was drawn up, I think, in 1954 with the more uh, public service where it was $14 per plug, and then that was unfeasible. It's something like 56, so that had to be changed. It's the only instance I can think of. But then the charter ever, that's, you know, an economic impact. This came up. I, I think the city council should make the, do the number crunch. Mark? I guess as I look at the charter, I look at it as a fence within which the city council gets to operate. And I think we need to look at this as, is this, should this be within the boundary of things that are possible? I think, personally, I think it would be good to send this to the council just to let them make, first of all, the decision if they want this in our charter. And if they choose to have it in the charter, then they have a whole another discussion, and that is, do they want to be members? I also look at things like more at business association, who knows what may be coming in the future. Because this is a little broader, I think this gives the council some flexibility as we live now and into the future. And I think that's where, I think this is probably a really good idea to have go forward. Else. Julian? Yeah, um, something I just noticed too is, is per the uh, written up ordinance change uh, to our charter, it says the city is authorized to become a member of local chambers of commerce. To my understanding, there's only one, right? Yep. So why would we open? I think it's to keep it more broad. Is that what, John? Yeah, uh, so I think. So I don't uh, delve into two things. So first of all, uh, the discussion about this is adding to the uh, charter, which goes on for years and years and years. The current chamber may not exist in its same form in five years. Uh, people who are looking at the chamber from a purely political standpoint, that organization could fundamentally change politically in five years. And so the 
the decision here is whether you're going to authorize the council to have the ability to become a member of an organization like that. Uh, politics change, they can change overnight. Uh, organizations can change overnight. And so I, I think the focus is sort of misplaced on the current structure of the charter or the chamber today. That's probably a policy discussion for the council to look at. Do they want to become a member of the current chamber? Uh, maybe there's benefits, maybe there's not. This, um, this uh, amendment is just simply to authorize the council to join an organization like that. Perhaps in five years there could be a, a, another organization that is a chamber that's a, the Moorhead Chamber or some other organization. This is just giving the authority to do that for the council to go through that second analysis of whether they want to be a member or not. And, and I guess looking out for the best interests of the city, there's sort of been this question about, well, why would the city want to be a member of the Chamber of Commerce? Uh, oftentimes, when important issues come up for the city, like if the city wanted to have a sales tax in place for a community center to fund that, oftentimes it's good to have the support of your Chamber of Commerce because they're most impacted by sales taxes. If you're not at the table and you're not able to talk to the local businesses, passing a sales tax can be very difficult. It also places Moorhead at a competitive disadvantage because both Fargo and West Fargo can be members of it. North Dakota law doesn't have these same types of restrictions. And so looking out for the best interests of the city, from my view, it's very appropriate for the city to at least have that authority. No, I'm not, I'm not here to say that it's the right chamber or not, but just give the council that authority to make those decisions in the future. Can I follow up to that? Because he touched on my next question. Okay. And sorry, I'm bringing up a lot of questions. Uh, you mentioned the potential for you know politics change, all that good stuff. By passing this today, we're not just opening this up to the current council. We're opening this up to any council down the road that would want to throw some money to an organization, correct? It, it would have to be a local chamber of commerce. Well, right. That yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is our, you know, do we want to allow, and I know the council, with all due respect to everyone present, because I know there's a council member present, of which I am a good friend. I'm also related to a member of the council. I know it, I know they can get political, you know, and uh, I feel like this is opening a can of worms with regard to that whole situation or situations with regard to all the future councils. Is it worth it? And my, my last thing I would bring up is, uh, you know, I've, I've heard how the chambers as a whole behave politically. So is there a reason why we're not looking at membership for unions? I think, I think they bring some value to the table also. Um, but I was, you know, would, would either of our city staff present be able to answer that? Because, I mean, for my, my personal belief is that unions bring a lot to the table with regard, you know, I mean, it's hard to have economic development without employees. And uh, so, you know, at face value of just economic development, is there a reason why we're just talking the chamber and not the other side of the coin of well, unions? Yeah. Okay. But we're, we're still getting off track here. And, Are we? And, 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 but I think Mark's statement was more correct about... The charter builds this fence around, of, of what the council can uh, do or maneuver in. Um, and if I understand correctly, the chamber's membership is yearly. The, the people behind us here, one year can be a member, and the next year decide, no, it's not worth it, and not be a member. Um, but, and they are our elected officials. Those seats change all the time. Some of them might want to be a member, and some won't. Uh, so I, I don't think that we're setting a, a precedent where um, they're going to be a chamber member for life. We're, we're, setting, we're trying to decide if they should have the decision to be a member. And um, we're not elected officials. They are elected officials. They should, if we don't like the decision they make, we can change that by the votes. And, and that's the way I'm looking at it. I, I, uh, I, I think it's a tool in their toolbox that they should be able to have. Tom? 
And, you know, if we, if we give the council the, the decision, yes or no decision to make this, they can, they can at any time say, you know, we're not going to join this year because of this. I mean, so if something doesn't benefit the city, the council does not have to, that's not a required thing. I mean, it, it's, you know, like to put it away, if, if something goes against more on it, we, we do not need to continue membership on it. The council has that flexibility too, correct? Correct. No. So we're just, so I, I agree with what Athena says that the charter should be to safeguard, you know, the, uh, the, the city's operating structure and everything, but I, I think it's got kind of, I, I think our job too is to enhance the tools our leaders have to get things done. And I think we're at a disadvantage when we have all these other cities that are participating and we're not. And we are looking at uh, uh, growth in Moorhead, and as John alluded to, sales taxes and things like that, other tax incentives that may come forward to help our city grow. Uh, the chamber can be a benefit in that, but then, you know, uh, and again, I'm kind of divulging off into that too, but I, and I think we just, I mean, if we send this proposed amendment to the city council, it's up to them to make that call, not, not us, and it very well might might get not passed there, and then and that's a mute point. But I think uh, by letting them make that decision is uh, a benefit. So, Dave, you just agree that uh, it's the job of our elected officials to make these kinds of decisions. I'm not sure I'm comfortable as an unelected person uh, circumventing their ability to represent the people who voted for them. I think your point about does it enable all future commissions to be able to make this, that is the point. Um, as tides change, as people get voted in, we want the will of the people to be reflected in all future commissions. So, I'm, yeah, I, I agree with Chair Steve. Okay. Anything else, Athena? I just had a question. So our basic question is, should the council, have, should the city, Morgan City Council have the ability to join um, private organizations to which dues are paid? Um, if we approve, if, they, if we send this to them, this amendment as you have written it, would that set a precedent for them to join other private organizations that we try to do? So the way this is drafted, it would have to be some type of local chambers of commerce. That was what I was requested to draft. Um, I would need to do additional research regarding other uh, private organizations. Uh, there are provisions within state law for different organizations. I'll, I'll use one example, like a, a city can become part of a cemetery association. There, there's just certain carve outs in state law in Minnesota that allow cities to do things. And so it, it's a, you're asking a very general question when there's a lot of very you know, specific authorization for different entities. Um, another example is cities can provide private funds and, uh, to uh, food shelves. They, they can donate up to a certain amount. So state law has a lot of different carve outs for private organizations. This is just for local chambers of commerce. Are donations though, as opposed to uh, I'd have to go back and look at the, the statute. I know uh, of at least another city that uh, became a member of a food shelf because they need the food shelf needed additional funds, and it was authorized by state statute. So, Julian, could I make a motion to amend this proposed change? Yep, sure can. Can I can I move that we change the wording to? Local organizations. Oh, sorry. Can I? Uh, I'd like to move that we amend this proposed change to local organizations and not just chambers of commerce. Do I hear a second? Second. Second by Kathy. Discussion. So. Um, purpose of your amendment be to what? Um, I, I'm trying to figure out where you're going with that. Well, I'm, I'm curious as to why we're looking at membership specifically of the chamber, when there are lots of local organizations that I think contribute very much to economic development of our city. Um, yeah. Any 
Any other discussion? Julian? And by making this change, clearly we would not exclude ourselves from becoming members of the chamber, but we're just allowing the possibility to become dues-paying members of other local organizations that contribute to our local economy. Joel? To Joel? John's point earlier, I guess you said you did want to word it um, loosely, so would that be something that would be Advantageous or? What I would what I would suggest is if if you want to pursue the organizations that you would say the city is authorized to become a member of local chambers of commerce and organizations to designate representatives from the city council to serve in the chambers and organizations and to appropriate funds to cover membership fees and expenses associated with local chambers uh, of commerce and organizations just so that. Um, my concern is the state auditor has sometimes taken a very narrow view of public expenditures and just be nice to call out the chamber and just add in the and organizations. I would agree since it is something they look at the, to have that word. So to, to John's point, to have the chamber specifically mentioned and other organizations, that would cover your request to Julian. But so what what exactly is the value to to singling the chamber out specifically? So the state auditor, it, it's mostly directed at the state auditor. The state auditor has sometimes taken a very narrow view with cities around the state uh, regarding their public expenditures. And just to be clear that we do have authority to have uh, uh, can pay the dues associated with local chambers and just add in and organizations and because uh, I because as I said there's many carve outs in state law for other organizations so to, if we were under audit from the state auditor I would rather point if there was another organization the city wanted to belong to I'd rather follow up on the state law uh, if there's a specific provision and then fall back on other organizations and so it, just from a drafting standpoint I would like to I would like to see chambers called out in there and so that we don't run into any issues with the state auditor. And when you, if I may follow up, when you say narrow focus, the, the auditors had a narrow focus, what do you mean by that? So the state aud auditors can take a more generic view of public purpose expenditures or they can take a very narrow view and narrowly interpret the law. Um, it, the law sometimes with political subdivisions can be narrowly interpreted, uh, be very conservatively, or you can breathe a lot of life and, well, that qualifies or that qualifies. In the last number of years, the state auditor has taken a very narrow position, uh, contrary to some of the past state auditors who have taken a very broad position. So it's just a matter of protecting the entity. It would be nice to say that we have specific authority to become part members of local chambers of commerce. And we can certainly add in and organizations. I don't, I don't have any issues with adding that language in. By adding that, would uh, you don't see any other issues with state statutes by saying organizations? No. Going, or I'm sorry, I should take someone else. Athena? Um, is the Attorney General uh, position based, uh, it looks to me like it's based on the distinction between a statutory authorization to appropriate and use money for a purpose as opposed to authorization to contribute money to a body that's committed to advancing a purpose? Um, and that is what the Chamber of Commerce is because it's a lobbying group. Okay. No, that's uh, the position that's been taken is that you need statutory authorization or authorizes authorization in your charter for the expenditure. It has nothing to do with the the politics or the advancement. It's is there a specific section within state law that would authorize the expenditure? And right. so I'm, just, the, I'm looking at the statute, uh, Minnesota statute four six nine point one eight nine which um, says that the Attorney General has taken the position that there's a distinction between statutory authorization to appropriate use money for a purpose um, as opposed to authorization to contribute money to a generally committed uh, organization advancing a particular purpose. So I'm just asking, um, is that based on the fact that the Chamber of Commerce, which has to be singled out as a particular um, organization in the auditors, 
the gun stations are at book. Is that because of the fact that the Chamber um, um, of Commerce is a lobbying group, a private lobbying group? I'd have to go back and look at the AG's opinion again, but I, I think the, the distinction that they were calling out is part of their analysis of whether it qualifies as a public purpose expenditure or not. Oh. And so that, that they made a determination that it wasn't a public purpose expenditure without uh, the appropriate statutory authorization or charter authorization. And so that's why we're adding in the charter authorization. Once you have charter authorization, if we want to become a member of an organization then, or, or the chamber, then there's specific authorization in place for it. Thank you. <clears throat> so would you be comfortable with amending your motion to John's suggestion of keeping uh, uh, chamber membership um, noted here and then adding and organizations? Oh, sure. And Kathy seconded, it's all right. Any other discussion on it? With that in mind, um, uh, let's we'll vote on this, uh, sending this proposed amendment. Now, if we send it to the council, if they want to amend any wording of, of this, would they say, be sending it back to us? No, they would not send it back to you. They, if, if it's just clean up language or, I mean, doesn't substantively change it, uh, then they would just have a second reading. If it's a substantive change, then it would come back to you. Okay, so all in favor? Oh, can I? Okay. I believe that we need to approve the amendment to the amendment before we approve the amendment as a whole. That's correct. Okay. Well, I think it was offered as a friendly amendment. And if I understand it correctly, that we can just vote on the amendment as a whole because I accepted no. the amendment. Yes. Yeah. So my understanding is it was a friendly amendment, so you still have to vote on the amendment to the ordinance and then vote on the underlying ordinance. Okay. First and, of all, oh, I was going to ask for a roll call vote. Okay. We can do that. First of all, we will ask for a vote on the amendment to the ordinance or to the the charter change. Point of order before we do our, our vote. Okay. We have two members who have not been actually authorized to vote yet. They haven't had their um, oath of office administered. Okay, I'll look to our city attorney on that, but we still, we will still have a quorum here, I guess. Yeah, you'd still have a quorum. We could have the city clerk administer yeah, the oath. Okay. So, so maybe we'll ask Michelle to give them the oath of office so they don't feel like they're wasted their time sitting here today. <laughs> Do you have a vote? We may have to dig that up out of a file, and so I thought we did too. Yeah, I thought we had it in that packet. But. It's not a document in Dropbox. Yes. <laughs> I do apologize, it was in here. We cleaned up the binder to have it as an example. I can't stay up that late. Yeah. I'm sorry it ended the way well, I mean, I'm kind of sorry. It ended. I should have been asleep before my husband did. Well, I, I gave myself one more inning and then they did do so. 17 innings? 16 innings? Really? Yeah. We tried to do it away multiple times. Maybe in between this. I believe we are ready. I'm sorry, what? You have to get something from your office? Oh, well, do you want to? Can't, can't you just administer? Yeah, just read it and then they can sign the certificate later. Okay. Just want to do, do it individually, read it to them, and then they'll sign it later. Okay. 
I, Kathy Child, do solemnly swear that I will support and comply with the Constitution of the United States of America. Do solemnly swear that I will comply with the Constitution of the United States of America. The Constitution and laws of the state of Minnesota. The Constitution and laws of the state of Minnesota. The charter, laws, and ordinances of the city of Moorhead. The laws, charter, and ordinances of the city of Moorhead. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties delegated to me. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties delegated to me. As a member of the Moorhead City Charter Commission, to the best of my judgment and ability. As a member of the Moorhead City Charter Council, to the best of my ability. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> Dave Cedarquist. Do you solemnly swear that I will support and comply with the Constitution of the United States of America? Do solemnly swear that I will support and comply with the U with the Constitution. Constitution of the United States of America? The Constitution and laws of the state of Minnesota. The Constitution and laws of the state of Minnesota. The Charter, laws, and ordinances of the city of Moorhead. The Charter, laws, and city ordinances of the city of Moorhead. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties delegated to me as a member. And that I will faithfully discharge the duties delegated to me as a member. Of the Moorhead City Charter Commission to of, the best of my judgment and of, of the Moorhead City Charter Commission to the best of my judgment. To the best of my judgment and ability. Congratulations. And I apologize for that. I guess I should have looked, um, and maybe I'll look to Michelle next. If we ever have any new members, please make sure that gets put on the agenda so we can do that right away at the beginning of the meeting. Um, so we were looking for a roll call vote on the amendment to the uh, proposed amendment to the charter. So we will start out, uh, well, I'll ask Michelle to do the roll call vote. Julian Yes. Russell Hansen? No. Elvin Holden? Yes. Kathy Child? Yes. Jane Steen? Yes. Corey Norton? Athena Grayson? No. Tom Gravenoff? Yes. Mark Foxley? No. Yes. Joel Breyer. Yes. And the count on that is, I think, four no. Three no. Three no. And seven yes. Motion to amend the amendment passed. And now uh, we will move on to the amendment itself as amended. Uh, to forward this to the city council. So do I hear a motion on that? I move to vote to send this to the council. Second. Second by Julian. Discussion. We signify by, well, let's do another roll call vote. We'll just stay with that. Um, Michelle? Julian Douglas? Yes. No. Ellen Yes. Kathy Child? Yes. James Steen? Yes. Corey Warren? Athena Grayson? No. Tom Gravino? Yes. Mark Foxman? Yes. Dave Sutterquist? Yes. Angel Ryder? Yes. So if my count is right, two, two no, and some yes. Motion carried and passed. We will send this forward to the City Council. Okay. Um, primary elections, information to follow. I think um, this is still kind of an item for discussion. I don't know if we've, we haven't uh, had any proposed 
a draft for this, John? Uh, um, no, I have not drafted a proposed amendment at this point because we were still looking for input from the Charter Commission. So I think uh, the issue is pretty straightforward from a drafting standpoint. The question is whether you want to amend the Charter to include primary elections for City Council members and the Mayor. Uh, the primary election would occur along with the state primary election. Uh, I, just thinking through the issue, uh, you could potentially have four uh, uh, individuals running for a council seat. They would have to uh, participate in the primary and then you would select two to move on. Uh, and the language is relatively straightforward. There's obviously political issues associated with uh, having primaries. Uh, and uh, I'm going to let you guys discuss those sorts of issues. But I, I can draft it. It's pretty straightforward. I included a couple different charter provisions uh, regarding uh, primary elections. But it's really, it comes down to do you want to allow primary elections? Um, and it, it's very straightforward from a, from a legal standpoint. <laughs> And there are examples in your packet of other cities that um, allow the primary election. As I'm assuming there is, I mean, there is no, really no additional cost for the elections because the county is still having those elections in August. And I think I have to find it here, but in one of the memos that was sent out, it gave the cost of the last few years of each election. And I think you noticed in 2017 it was a pretty low cost. So, um, but, and I've asked some friends and uh, other city, citizens from the city, their opinion on it, and I have not heard too much negativity on it. Um, they all think it's probably a good idea, but I'm interested in hearing the cons, too. I'd like to hear some, do any of the count, uh, commissioners have any uh, opinions on it, and I understand we do have some of the audience that wants to speak on it too. So I'll go with, uh, well, yeah. let's go with uh, Deb White, uh, City Council person. Do you, do you wish to speak on this item? Not as a City Council person. Okay, as a citizen. As a citizen. <laughs> okay. Thank I'm you. I'm sorry, I apologize. No, that's okay. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, and actually, I'll just share a little bit about my background. So I know you, many of you know I'm on city council, but um, for the last 30 years, I've been working as a political sociologist, and my uh, primary area of interest is looking at our electoral process. So I have a extensive knowledge on um, some of the barriers that I, that um, uh, keep people from running for office. I, for the last 16 years, coordinated a public leadership program for women that serves um, our entire region. And so I've worked with hundreds of people who have either considered running for office or have run for office. And so, so I base this on my you know, extensive um, experience that I've had. And, and as I said, one of the biggest things that I look at is the barriers that keep people from running for office. And um, one of the things that we see throughout the United States is the biggest reason why people don't run is the amount of time that it takes and the amount of money. And, and um, it's become more and more expensive, more and more time consuming, and we're seeing that creeping down more and more at the local level I would argue to the detriment of our democratic process that particularly at the local level we should have elected bodies that represent our citizens but what we find is that more often it's people who have more flexible time so somebody like a professor that has uh, more time even though we do work in the summers but <laughs> but we have a little more time on our hands that have more resources um, and that's becoming more and more the case and um, so the average citizen it becomes harder and harder for them to run for office changing the process and adding a primary would further perpetuate that, would further um, limit the number of people who are able to run for office. And so if you think about, for instance, when I ran last year, I started my campaign in June, that we didn't have a primary, um, and I wasn't the first person who um, announced that I was running. So six months that it took out of my time to run for office, um, I, um, I would say I spent less than other candidates, but still, I had to raise a substantial amount of money. Now we're talking about moving that process back a couple of more months, so now we're telling people that you're going to spend more than a half of a year working on a campaign. They'll have to start their campaigning earlier. They'll have to raise more money. And so for a lot of people, those are things that are going to just deter them from running for office. 
Beyond that, more importantly, you are seeking a solution for a problem that does not exist in Moorhead. And I know that other cities have looked at and have currently changed their electoral process. Probably the one that draws the most attention is Fargo. Fargo does at-large elections, so you have this scrum of a large number of people running for a few seats. Moorhead has a ward system, and so we don't elect our, ca our candidates in the same, or we don't select our elected officials in the same manner. So I looked at the um, elections for the last 10 years. So uh, I do apologize, I was missing the data for 2011, but I went on the Secretary of State's webpage to look at all of the ward races that we have had and the mayoral elections that we've had <coughs> since 2009. And I wanted to give you a little data because if you're imposing this, this would affect all candidates whether or not a primary is even necessary. So since 2009, we've had 16, I looked at 16 different city council races, again, I was missing data from 2011. Of those 16 races, there were only two cases where there were more than three candidates, okay? Only two cases. In nine, there was only one or two candidates. So for nine of the 16, the primary wouldn't even be relevant. But all of those candidates would have had to, again, file earlier, begin the campaign earlier, raise more money, and commit to a longer election process. Um, there were, again, so if there were nine that only had one or two candidates, two that had five candidates, and the other remaining ones, the other uh, five, had um, three candidates. So we're having a primary to, in mo and at most, in most cases, go from three candidates to two. In our mayoral races, of the last three mayoral races that we had during that time, we had two, three, and four candidates. And so we really don't have an issue in Moorhead where a primary would be relevant. But again, by doing so, what you will do is further deter people from running for office and guarantee that we will have fewer people and, and um, less wide representation within our community. And so I strongly discourage you from considering at this time um, introducing a primary in Moorhead. Thank you. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Any questions for her? If not, any other discussion from commissioners on this item? Any questions? Is that a question? Okay. So is this a situation where we are deciding here within the Charter Commission to have primaries? It's not something we're kicking up to the commission with the commissioners and they make the ultimate decision you, about having you would uh, if if you want to proceed with an amendment to the charter I would draft one and then it would go on to the council for a vote uh, or you could submit it to the people I think from my standpoint I, I just need direction from you as a group if it's something you're even interested in indulging in is this something John if um, if we did want to direct it to the people uh, I know there's uh, an election this fall, November, uh, on a bond referendum. Is Could this be put on that election, or would it have to wait to a general election? I think it could be put on this fall's election. We'd have to go back and check if there's sufficient time to get everything on the ballot. But it, I think there is. I mean, we're probably within the window. But we'd want to have a, 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 you know, a formal document and language for people to vote on. So that would mean we would have to have a proposed amendment drafted fairly soon, probably, Correct. to get on that one. Um, again, and that would allow the citizens to decide. Um, otherwise, we could do the same process we just did, send it to the council to let them decide. So that's another option. Um, I think Deb brought up some good points, some points I never thought of. Um, I, I ran an election, too. There was five other people in that election. One of the two, yeah. And, um, um, it's fine. I mean, uh, it's, a lot, it's a big word. <laughs> but um, there again, uh, and we've had some fine candidates that have won with 20% of the vote, and they've turned out to be great mayors and ward people, you know, probably. But the, some of the feedback I've gotten, too, is, you know, um, they're not the, the majority of the vote. They're not getting the majority of the people. Uh, the other thing I would consider, too, is uh, during primary um, turnout probably isn't as much either, that maybe that would help the turnout on, the, on some of the primary elections. Uh, I'm not sure, so I'm, uh, I'm interested in more discussion on it. Um, 
I don't know if it would have to be put on this November one. I mean, if, I mean that seems like it would be rushing it. I mean, we could have John draft a proposed amendment, take a look at it, and send it to the council for their thoughts. Um, just some options. Um, discussion. Was this um, proposed amendment to the was the request for this from a group or from an individual? I believe it was from an individual. Yeah, the request came from a citizen in Moorhead. Okay, thank you. Julian? What, did, did the individual, sorry that you're just getting up, uh, Manager Bulkers, but did the individual that contacted you, did they give a reason why? I seem to remember, they, Maybe, I can't remember, sorry. No, that's fine, thanks. Um, I, I, there was no reason given, just, just because other cities in Minnesota about our size have done this. That was the only reason this person gave me, and so she just wanted it considered before the commission, just as you know, part of your process and your due diligence about what the charter should say for the city of Moorhead. I think it's an interesting discussion to have, um, especially, I would, doesn't look like there's any cost to it. Um, but um, again, I, I, I see some points, pro and cons on it. Um, is that something we want to push? Is it something that if, uh, I mean, there's different ways things can come to us, and I, I've stated this before, I, the way I prefer them to come from us. I prefer an amendment to come from within. I prefer an amendment to come a proposed amendment to come from the council or a proposed amendment to come from the citizens, which is, I think the rule is 5% of the last uh, registered voters or the people that voted in the last election. Um, I think at, at times we could get bogged down by having one citizen come and say, hey, we need to take a look at this and that. But, um, but I think <clears throat> stating that, that this is a good discussion to have. It, 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 it's to the core of our charter, probably, of, of is it a good idea or not a good idea. Um, so I'm open for more discussion. I have, and I think I asked at the last meeting if any of you would talk to your neighbors and uh, try to get their thoughts on it. Um, I don't know if, <laughs> I, you know if you have. I'd love to hear those comments. Mark? I stated it last time too, and that is there is, and I did chat with several people about it, but there is a legitimacy issue in some respects to get a majority, coming to office with a majority of voters has a lot better feel than getting a plurality of three people or four people. And I think back to a governor's election several years ago where it was what, 34, 33, and 32 percent, uh, winner got 34. And we've seen some other uh, local elections that have had that same kind of a split. Uh, I understand uh, Ms. White's comments on getting more people involved. The other side of that coin is I think we've seen a lot of people interested in and running for office in town here. And I don't know if having a primary would actually detour. In some respects, it might bring a few more people out since they would feel at least that if they could, uh, they could get out and do something, they could actually get into that final two rather than getting in, a, in this plurality type of thing. So I can see, I could see where both ways would be good, but uh, having been in office myself, I would, I, I felt much better having a majority of all voters. Exactly, and I think that's a good point. And I, um, uh, to one of uh, Ms. White's points too about the cost of it. Um, thinking on the fly here, if uh, granted, you do have to start a month or two earlier to out, you know, start out door knocking. Um, but I think it may be once, if you reach that primary, you still got to have so much money. But once you reach that primary, and if you're one of the, one of the finalists of the two, uh, I can see a benefit of being able to raise more money for your campaign. Um, so that might be a benefit also. Um, but 
I yeah. spoke to several people and they asked why would we need a primary? <laughs> because we have so few people who run for most of our offices and you know, the history of winning by a slim majority is pretty common. So, you know, there are a lot of elected officials who get in, um, you know, majority wins. And so once they've achieved that, they're good. I don't think there's any question about the legitimacy, even though it would be a slim majority. So um, most of the people I spoke to didn't see a reason for a primary. Yes, <clears throat> one of the things we could do is have John um, write up a proposed amendment, um, although I'm afraid it would look real similar to the ones in the packet, and we could discuss it at a meeting. Down. I mean, as I don't know, unless somebody wants to make a motion to send a, a proposed amendment to the council immediately for a, a, this November election, I don't see the rush in it at this meeting. But um, again, Dave? Just a question, it's not clear to me, some offices already have primaries and other positions don't have primaries? I was just city. not here. Yeah, and I can, I can respond to that. So a number of cities in Minnesota have local primaries and a number do not. And by municipal primaries, we're typically talking about city and schools. So in Moorhead, we have federal and state primaries, which are partisan, and then the county has a primary as well, which is nonpartisan. Okay, okay thank you. Mm -hmm. May I suggest that we just have an informal poll to see who might be interested in moving forward with this or not? Uh, because it could be that we're just talking amongst ourselves for <laughs> yep. just talking amongst ourselves. If there isn't an interest in moving forward, then maybe we should uh, drop this at this point. Okay. Well, let's. Just go around the table, uh, or a show of hands, or anybody interested in pursuing this? Um, raise your hand or say aye. That's a good question. <laughs> I, think, I think it actually is a good question. I think it may be a little too early since Moorhead just switched to even your elections. And I think maybe another election cycle or two with city uh, offices may show if we're going to see more or less candidates. If we see more candidates, uh, that might be when we start seriously looking at this. But I agree to points being made. While it would be nice to have a majority vote, the reality is there aren't maybe that many people yet running for office. So let's, let's see how things progress. Personally, let's see how things progress. And if it seems to be problematic, let's solve a problem when we have one. Tom? Does anybody know or can we get the information on, um, you know, the number of people that have ran for office, if it's, in, if it's declining or increasing from the past, say, 20 years? That, that would be, I think that would be helpful for the discussion if there's, you know, so I mean, 20 years ago there was, you know, four or five people running for, uh, a city council seat or mayor or whatever, I, I guess that would be, I think that would be helpful information to make a decision. Jeff, do you have information All on that? All that is available on the Secretary of State's webpage, so you can look up election <coughs> results. And um, as I said, the I went back the last 10 years, but you can go back further than that. Some of that was, would not necessarily be available on the web, but the Secretary of State's office can provide all of that information. I was, and, I was yeah. wanted to kind of focus in more Moorhead specific, I guess. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, I looked okay, at okay. I looked at specifically Moorhead over the last, since 2009, I looked at every Moorhead election. They just didn't, on the web page, the data for 2011 was not available. So I looked at this, that's where the, the 16 city council races I referred to were Moorhead city council races since 2009, so with our four wards, so missing one year's worth of data. And so, um, uh, but the Secretary of State's webpage shows that. So you can see the candidates, and that's where, as I was saying, that over those 16 elections, there were only two where they had more than three candidates. So we had two, they had five, Jim was in one of them, so yeah. Um, but the other ones, we nine of those 16, there were only one or two candidates. So in some cases, we've actually had, we've had um, council members who've run unopposed. Michelle, is there a possible way you can get that out to the council members for us to look at? Mark? 
One thing that I think skews the numbers that you're asking for, Tom, gets to be the fact that we went from odd to even year elections. And that's going to really, I think that really changed the shape of the last election that we held, uh, being that was the first on an even year, because we're having a lot more voters. Uh, we get voter drop off, of course, but we still had a lot more voters than we normally had had on the off year elections. So I think moving forward, starting with the 20, 16 election, 2018 election. <laughs> uh, moving forward, I think the next few elections are really going to tell the new tale. I think so. I think the past information is good, but we have to look at that with that skew in there that we're going to have different numbers and people voting now uh, in our even year elections. I think when you go, um, we're talking about. Um, number of voters, but I think Tom's original question was number of candidates. Have they, have they increased? No, it actually decreased slightly this last one. So for the count before council races in 2018, there was actually, initially there were two wards that had three candidates and then one dropped out. So we only had one ward that had three candidates. All the others only had two and we had three candidates for the mayoral race. So we didn't even have any that had more than that. Keep in mind when I was looking at these other charter or how they do it, um, uh, they're not included in the primary unless there's more than two candidates. Otherwise, they're not included in the primary. Um, so I guess you would know early on, too, if you were running, if you were going to be in a, pri a primary election. Not before you filed. So you'd still have to meet the earlier deadline to file. Yep. And then so you'd have to start your camp. All, everybody would have to start their campaign early, even though some of those, in most cases, the, the, you, the primary would be unnecessary if we continued with the trend that we've had. So there's a lot of cases where there wouldn't even be a primary, probably. So. And you know, Mark asked the question, are, are we as a commission interested in pursuing this? And is this the right time <coughs> to pursue it? And um, I didn't hear from any of you a lot of, yeah, let's pursue it right now. Um, so maybe it's something that uh, we just table indefinitely. Um. I, I think it's something that would be better engaged with the four to six speakers down the line, I guess, personally, you know, when we get the numbers established for the even year as opposed to. That being said, then I guess we'll just uh, drop it for now. And we will, uh, any, we'll just move on to any new business. Any commissioners have any new business? Thank you, Deb. Mark? Um, in my discussion with people, I ran into somebody asked a very interesting question that maybe, since we don't have anything on our agenda coming, might be interesting to talk about. And I imagine it was because I was asking the questions, they asked the question back to me, and the question was, why doesn't the mayor vote in the city of Moorhead? Being that that's the only elected office in the city of Moorhead that's elected by all the people. Mm -hmm. And I gave that pat answer that, well, it was, seemed to be a compromise somewhere in the distant past when wards were much more... Uh, run by the ward uh, representatives? Uh, I don't know. And would that be a question that would be worth the time of this group? I know, um, the, I guess the mayor has a tie-breaking vote, correct me if I'm wrong, and he has veto power. He or she has veto power. That's, that's correct. But with eight uh, council members plus the mayor, you'd, you'd get rid of for the most part, you get rid of the uh, voting to break a tie. And I can see that there would be a lot of positives and some negatives for it. And again, I think it might be worth the effort to go, on to the, go down the path of discussion on that anyway. It's in my mind. I, I, I think that gives the mayor a lot of power, having that tie-breaking vote and the veto power. But um, anybody else? 
Haven't we wrangled with this we question have, we, before? We have a couple years ago. But, yeah. And I think we decided to move that line. So, um, but, you know. Mm -hmm. you um, any other thoughts on that? If not, um, we'll go ahead, Dave. I was just going to ask the question again. Um, what's the advantage if the mayor is already breaking ties? I, I guess I'm not understanding what the advantage is. <clears throat> well, it was just brought up in discussion. That is the, uh, and now I can speak from my point of view, uh, the mayor's, since he's elected or she is elected <laughs> by everybody, there's a different view that you have than being elected by one quarter of the citizens. You see things a little differently. And by being able to vote, and you'd be able to also bring in a little more discussion from the mayor. Uh, I've sat in on other council meetings around the state of Minnesota. I've sat in a couple commission meetings over in Fargo. Uh, when, when the mayor is a voting member, the viewpoint of the mayor becomes more uh, important in almost anything. The reality is there's very few issues that really get to be important, or let me rephrase that. Um, <laughs> there gets to be very few things where there's a lot of dissension on any city vote, whether it's Moorhead or Fargo or Rochester or wherever. Uh, but having the mayor have that capability on a constant basis uh, helps the council members kind of see where, where, that, where the mayor thinks the majority, the, all the citizens are. It also uh, keeps, it's kind of a check for the, for the mayor and the citizens. The mayor can't start drifting a little too far off of his base either, or her base. So I guess it's just a thought. Uh, and again, I wasn't aware this group had discussed it earlier. Yeah, we, but it, it's, it was a heavy discussion there for a couple of years ago. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of that there. So I, yeah. I think Dave was in the spinning. I only the discussion every week. Yeah, it got a little yeah. contentious, sir. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. That's helpful. <laughs> I think you have a very viable idea there. And I know of people who would support that, definitely support that. And looking at, you know, the mayor is the focal point there. And you do get a completely different perception of what's going on. And I think it would be worth, again, taking a look at this and maybe inviting some of the citizens in here to talk about it. Can we perhaps Question. get some more along? I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, doesn't the mayor have the ability to give their um, understanding of a situation in discussion anyway? The mayor can do that because he's running the meeting. It can slow it down a little bit. Uh, or it's hard to be the person that's running the meeting, i.e. the referee, and start giving opinion. Uh, so it's a safe way, to, safe way to be the mayor, is to not say much, work a little more, more behind the scenes. That works very well, but I think uh, having a mayor uh, being able to speak has some strengths too. You're not stick talking about speaking, you're talking about voting. Voting and then the, being a part of the discussion too, a stronger part of the discussion. Yeah, well, in my mind, the mayor definitely sets the course and, and, I, and I, you know, I, I, I see merits on both sides, but um, myself being in, you know, military positions where I have, you know, uh, several subordinates underneath me, if I have six of them say, well, I think we should go this way, and I have two that say we go this way, it's, you know, it's kind of my thing to bring everything together and, and you know, pick the course. And, and, I, and I like where the mayor now can kind of, you know, set, set sail with things and get their input in, and, and that veto is very powerful, too. That's, so I think we do have a very powerful mayor, and then the, the, I think if the mayor wants to get their word out, you know, they, they have the, uh, 
media at their disposal and everything else too. So it definitely set you know sail on the first day we want to take the city. But I you know if, if we uh, take this further, I, I guess I'd like to look at our notes so we can you know our past notes from a couple years ago and to see what, what all the thoughts were then and everything. I was here for those discussions, but okay. John, did you have a statement? Well, not, not so much a statement, just an observation when you're thinking about the mayor's veto power. Uh, keep in mind, many votes require six votes of the council, and you can override the mayor's vote or veto with six votes. So uh, you have the inter interconnection between the veto authority and the supermajority requirements. So the veto only really becomes powerful if you have an item that requires a simple majority. send out we could look for the past discussions and send out the minutes and links to the videos if that would be helpful I, th I think it would be because a lot of these questions definitely came up in the past and everything <coughs> well uh, let's let's do that okay. um, and then I guess um, we can have this discussion at a after people have reviewed that and if, if see if we want to pursue that again um, and if not we can decide not to again I mean I, I, there was a lot of points on both sides if I remember I remember some most of the conversation on that um, and I remember us deciding to leave it as it was but um, I guess it wouldn't hurt to review it again for some of the new charter members so and some of the older ones that uh, like, like Tom and I don't remember everything so, <laughs> and Eldon so. <laughs> Get the old okay, so we will get that out to the uh, commissioners. Um, any other new business? See none, we will be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.